Good morning, CLC. This is a day that the Lord has made. Have you rejoiced and are you glad in it? We have to ask ourselves that question each and every day. It's a new day. It's a new, there are going to be new things happening. There's going to, there are going to be possibly new problems, new situations. But if we still understand and realize it's a day that the Lord has made, we can rejoice and we can be glad in it. That's why, as always, we talk about we can give thanks and everything because we know that God's in control and that He loves us and I think He has our best interest at hand. I really do. But He wants us to honor Him and to serve Him and to love Him. And uh, one way we can do that is rejoice in Him. So with that said, Christmas is behind us. I pray that you had a great Christmas time. Uh, hopefully you got everything that you asked for. Um, but through it all, I pray that you rejoiced. I pray that you really thought about the true meaning of Christmas. And I pray that as we go through, head into a new year, that that thought process will be with us every day. It's about Jesus, right? All right. Today, we're going to kind of look back over what we did last Sunday. And as we talked about um, the virgin, the virgin birth, we talked about the name of Jesus. We talked about Emmanuel, God with us. One of the things that I had you to do, I gave you homework, and hopefully you did it. And if you didn't, uh, let me know so I can give you a zero on your, on your weekly grade. Uh, but I won't do it in red ink because that just will make you feel bad. But anyway, um, I had you to read uh, Isaiah chapter 7 because I want us to look at one particular verse. You know which one I'm talking about, but we'll hit it here in just a moment. And we're going to build ourselves up to it, but understanding that we're going to look at a whole passage in order just to be able to uh, explain why we believe in the virgin birth. One verse that uh, we're going to read. That's known as apologetics. You know, that's one of those uh, school words. Apologetics may simply be defined as the defense of the Christian faith. Do you know how to defend your Christian faith? Do you know why you believe what you believe? And again, I say this all the time. It's not because your pastor, it's not because your teacher, it's not because somebody in your past has told you. We have to learn how to make it real for ourselves. And when we do that, then when the skeptics come along or the naysayers and they say, well, you know, this can't be or that can't be or prove it to me or why do you believe what you believe? We know how to give an answer because we know why we believe what we believe. And so being able to defend what we believe, that's called apologetics. Uh, it is reasoned arguments or writings and justification of something. And in this case, of justification of why we believe what we believe about the word of God. Last week, we started out with Matthew chapter 1. Now, here's a point that we need to understand. It's been 400 years since the Lord spoke through His prophets. So, here we've gone, they've gone 400 years. They have not heard from the Lord. They have not heard from the prophets. And, you know, I was thinking about that this week. Can you imagine 400 years without hearing anything from the Lord? Can you imagine how much straying away from the Lord has gone on? I mean, here we are as a society, as a church, you know, what we've been nine months to where it's been hit or miss, whether we can come together. And when we do come together, we can't all come together. And then there are those of you who are watching, and, and, and I'll say it again, if, if you have underlying conditions and you're um, of a certain age and you have concerns, you need to be at home and you need to be watching this. But there's a lot of people in our church and in every church that have just, um, I want to be careful with this, but you, you know what I'm talking about. We've gotten lazy and it's easier to stay home. It's easier to not come together. Those of you who are watching, I'm not talking to you, probably. Um, but there's a lot of people who are not going to be watching this that claim CLC as their home church. They're getting no fellowship here with us no live fellowship. Most of them are not watching uh, this uh, message each Sunday morning. And so what's happening is there's going to be a great falling away from the church, I believe, because of all this. And so my encouragement to you is if you're healthy enough, 
Come back to church. You need to be in church. And I want to encourage you with that. Matthew chapter 1. Again, it's been 400 years since the Lord spoke through his prophets. And we looked and, and Mary has found out, this virgin girl, this young girl, has found out that she is pregnant. And her betrothed husband, the Joseph, the one who she's engaged to, finds out about it. And he's ready to give her a, a written divorce. We talked about that last week, so we're not going to spend a lot of time. But I do want to read this passage again to get us into what we're talking about today. We're going to start in verse 20. But as he, Joseph, considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She is not pregnant from another man. The Holy Spirit has placed that seed within her. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And the very name Jesus means the Lord saves. We talked about there's something in a name last week. Look at verse 22. Look what Matthew tells us. And Matthew is being led by the Holy Spirit to write this. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. We just determined the prophet uh, that they're talking about is um, Isaiah. Here's what was spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which mean God, means God with us. And we spent all last week talking about that. So we're not going to spend any time trying to explain that again. But what we're going to do, we're going to read a whole chapter, or just about the whole chapter of um, Isaiah chapter 7, uh, just to give us the context of this single verse that as we read the chapter, it's going to look like it's kind of out of place. How did it get into Matthew and how can we trust it? We're going to see, it's going to, but it's a single verse to illustrate this principle that we hit on last week. Now we're going to hit on it heavily today. This principle of prophecy. That prophecy may have both a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. And as we get ready to discuss this, and as I've studied for it all week, and um, I just got to let you know, I love finding truth nuggets uh, in the scripture as I dig for gold. You know, um, the gold miner is always looking for the big haul, but they've got to, they've got to do samples and tests and find out if the ground has any gold in it. And every now and then they'll find this large nugget, maybe a half ounce nugget or something like that, and they get all excited, but that doesn't mean there's a lot of gold there. But as they're looking for the fine gold, which adds up and builds up and gives them their fortune, every now and then they'll find these nuggets that just gives them some excitement. And that's what I love to do. I love to find that nugget in the middle of the hole, if you will. And uh, it just keeps me coming back and it keeps me excited to find more. But before we get into our text, let's pray and let's ask God's blessings. Let's ask God to open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to his truth today. Father, we do thank you. This is the day that you have made. Lord, help us to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, I pray for blessings today as we read your word. I pray, Lord, as we try to learn a little bit more about how to defend what we believe and why we believe it, Lord, I pray that your spirit would teach us today. Thank you, Father. Bless those who are watching, those who are listening, Lord. I pray your blessings upon them and their families. For those who are sick, Lord, I pray a special touch and a healing of their body. And Lord, we're just going to trust you right now. We're blessed. We praise you. We love you and adore you. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. A little background here as we head into Isaiah chapter 7. The 12 tribes of Israel... Uh, they were split into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom uh, known as Israel, and there's a southern kingdom uh, that was known as Judah. This happened around 950 B.C. So ten tribes um, of Israel were at the north, with Judah and Benjamin as the two tribes to the south. And uh, in your notes uh, on the Bible app, uh, there's a map there, and it gives you an idea. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how they got there, but you can read about it in 1 Kings chapters 11 through 13, and I encourage you to go there because when we do this, it helps us to understand all these other things about Israel. You'll read about Solomon. You'll read about his son Rehoboam. You'll read about Jeroboam who, who rebelled against Rehoboam because Rehoboam was not really very good. He, uh, he was being harsh 
uh, to Israel. And so these 10 tribes, they decided to go uh, against him. And so Jeroboam, Jeroboam became the king. And so all this mess started where the north is fighting against the south. They had their own civil war, if you will. Okay. In our text for today, we're going to be looking at Ahaz. And Ahaz was a wicked king of Judah. Uh, Judah had more good kings than the northern tribe of Israel. Uh, in fact, they didn't have too many at all once all this separation took place. But Ahaz, Ahaz was a wicked king. He worshipped other gods. He even sacrificed, uh, the scripture says in 2 Kings 16, 1 through 4, he even sacrificed his son to the god Molech. The only good thing uh, that we read about Ahaz, seem, Ahaz seems to, uh, uh, to be with the fact that he was the father of Hezekiah, who became a good king of Judah. So that's about the only thing good that came from Ahaz. So let's, let's pick up our text in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, and we're going to read through it. I'll, I'll give a little detail along the way. But we're really wanting to get to verse 14, okay? That's our verse for today. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Yotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah. So what that's saying is Ahaz is the king of Judah. Retzim, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel. Pekah was the king of Israel. Came up to Jerusalem to wage war against uh, it. Against it. Now, Jerusalem is in Judah, and when it says came up to, uh, that's talking about its elevation. Jerusalem was higher, so they had to come up to it, okay? They actually came down south, going to try to take over um, uh, Jerusalem and, and Judah. But they came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. Now, you can read this whole story in 2 Kings chapter 16. I encourage you to go there. It makes all this make more sense. So as we're digging, as we're trying to get all that we can out of the Scripture, and we find out we can go somewhere else, and it supports it, it, it explains it, it gives us more detail, that's where you start finding these nuggets, these exciting nuggets. It's like, whoa, I never saw that. And you get excited about the Word of God. And that's important. Verse 2, when the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim. Ephraim is another name for Israel. Syria is in cohorts with, with Ephraim. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Here's some of that uh, figures of speech simile going on. The, the people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. In other words, they were scared and they were shaking. And we get the idea of looking at a tree in the wind, how it shakes and, and bristles and all that. So these people are scared. Verse 3, And the Lord said to Isaiah, Okay, here comes the prophet Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shirar Yashub. That's uh, uh, Isaiah's son. Go out and meet him, you and your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Now you read that, it means nothing to us, but as you read through Scripture, uh, these seemingly irrelevant details make an important point. You see, we're getting these details because all this happened to real people at a real time and in real places. And so these places, this conduit of the upper pool, on the highway to the washer's field is actually something that we can read. And history even points it out that it was a real place. But here's something cool about, here's a nugget. Uh, Isaiah's son, Shi'ar Yashub, it's a pretty cool name, actually means a remnant shall return. So God's got Isaiah going with his son to the king of Ahaz, and his son's name means a, a remnant shall return. And it's possible that his son came along with him as a walking object lesson so that Ahaz would realize that a remnant shall return. Now, for a remnant to return, that means that they've got to be taken away. And we know as we study about Israel, we study about uh, Judah, that they were displaced and dispersed. But he says a remnant shall return. And say to him, Isaiah, say to Ahaz, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, well, we could learn something about that. And do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. Now, when you read something like that, you've got to search and, and understand what he's talking about. At the fierce, fierce anger 
of uh, Redson and Syria and the son of Ramalia. So seemingly Ahaz needed to stop his talking about the problem. That's where he was told to be quiet. He needed to trust God and take courage in the Lord. Now, why was it so hard for Ahaz to do this? You know, you've got prophets, and these kings knew that these prophets spoke for the Lord. And you've got God speaking through Isaiah, telling Ahaz what to do. And yet we're going to see that Ahaz continued to fear. Ahaz put more trust in another country, another empire, than he actually did God. And that's because he didn't see the situation the way the Lord did. Many times when we're in a situation, when things aren't going the way we want it to go, then fear and panic and, and, and distrust kicks in. And we wonder, God, where are you? And he's where he's always been, on his throne in control. You say, why is this happening to me? When really we ought to say, why wouldn't this happen to me? But through it all, trusting in the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord, giving thanks in all thing, things, we can trust that God is in control and he cares. You see, Ahaz looked at Israel and Syria and saw a terrible threat. God looked at Israel and Syria and saw two stubs of smoking firebrands. Now, what in the world does that mean? To the Lord, they were all smoke and no fire. God's in control. He said, they're all talk, no action. They're going to try some things, but that's not my plan. So what God is saying to Ahaz um, um, through Isaiah is, chill out. And I want to encourage you right now. Maybe you're in a time of panic because of everything that's going on. Maybe you're struggling or whatever. God's in control. Do you believe that? If I believe that, then I need to chill out and trust Him. Okay? Verse 5, because Syria with Ephraim, with Israel, and the son of Ramalia has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. In other words, what they're saying, let us go take, uh, take Judah, and we're going to set up our own king, Tabil. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. This is what is being told to Ahaz through Isaiah. How could Ahaz not listen to the prophet of God? How is it that we don't listen to the Spirit of God and the Word of God? When we read what we say we believe to be truth, when we trust the Spirit, we say we trust the Spirit that lives within us, but we freak out, we fear, we panic at the drop of a hat. How is that? Well, we're really not trusting. And we see Ahaz did not trust in the Lord. Verse 8, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Retzin. And within 65 years, Ephraim, or Israel, will be shattered from being a people. So what Isaiah is telling Ahaz is, this is not going to happen. They're not going to overthrow you. And by the way, down the road, they're not even going to be in existence anymore. Okay? And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of uh, Ramalia, and that's Pekah. If you are, he says, if you are not firm in your faith, or in other words, if you will not believe, you will not be firm at all. If he will not believe, it will not affect the outcome of the attack against Jerusalem. God has already decreed that their attack would not succeed, right? So, I am getting messed up here. So here's what, he, what the king is being told. Surely you shall not be established. You don't have the faith. If you don't listen, if you don't pay attention, you're not going to be established. And again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah. He said, ask, catch this, the Lord speaking through Isaiah to the king Ahaz, to king Ahaz. And here's what God is saying to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. In other words, ask. Ask for a sign. Ask for anything. You see, God has just challenged Ahaz to believe and be blessed. And now God offers to give Ahaz a basis for belief, and that's a sign. Have you ever wanted God to give you a sign? You know, many times I prayed for something, and, and here would be my thing. 
God, if that's not where you want me to go, slam the door in my face. To me, that's a sign. God, if that's not what you want to do, want me to do, slam a door in my face. Don't allow me to walk through that door. I want to walk through the door that you want me to walk through. Give me a sign. God is telling Ahaz to ask for a sign. But Ahaz, verse 12 says, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. Now this sounds very spiritual from Ahaz, but it, but it is never testing God to do as he says. And he tells us all through his word to trust him. To trust him. In our giving, uh, if we sow sparingly, we, we reap sparingly. And if we sow generously, the Bible says that we reap generously. To me, that's God saying, go ahead and prove me. We know in Malachi to Israel, he was saying, prove me, give, bring your tithe and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. God was saying, prove me. Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test, even though God has said, test me, prove me. And he said, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? In other words, the rulers of Judah treated other people poorly, but they treated the Lord even more poorly. Ahaz was going to trust in Assyria to help him to get through this mess of, of, of Syria and Israel coming to take over uh, uh, Jerusalem. But he wouldn't trust in God. And many times we trust in our jobs. We trust in our finances. We trust in ourselves, our, our own ingenuity, our own knowledge, our own wisdom. When we won't trust in the Word of God, we won't trust in the Spirit of God. And then we wonder why we're miserable. We wonder why it doesn't turn out the way we want it to. I suppose we don't trust in God, and that's what Ahaz is going through. Now look, Isaiah has said, ask for a sign. Ahaz, Ahaz says, I will not, I will not, I will not. Verse 14, and here's our verse. Therefore, Isaiah says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You're not going to ask for one. He's going to give you one anyway. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. There you go. What's that got to do with what we read about in Matthew with uh, Joseph and Mary? Again, there can be a, a fulfillment early. There can be a second fulfillment later on. The Lord is going to give Ahaz a sign. Well, we know that it's going to be hundreds of years later before Mary comes on the scene. So what kind of sign could that be to Ahaz? Well, there's the far-reaching uh, coming about of this, of this sign coming to be, the prophecy taking place. The Lord has said, I will give you a sign, Ahaz, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before, check this, before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. In other words, it's not going to be long before this boy that I'm talking about shall grow up to be old enough to know good from evil. These two kings... And their efforts are going to be totally deserted. Simply put, God would give Ahaz a sign that within a few years, both Israel and Syria would be crushed. This was a sign of deliverance to Ahaz, but he wouldn't trust it. Verse 17 says, The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Israel departed from Judah. Then it says, the king of Assyria. What's it saying? This was bad news to Ahaz, who had been foolishly trusting in Assyria instead of the Lord. And Isaiah is telling Ahaz that the Assyrians will end up defeating you. You can read that story in 2 Kings chapter 16. But going back to verse 14, we're not going to finish the, the chapter. I'll give you just a summary of it here in just a moment. But going back to verse 14, and we look at that, and we look at, at a prophecy fulfilled early, and then this prophecy again fulfilled later on. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the whole basis of the Christian, that's the whole foundation of the Christian faith, the Christian belief. 
If I can't believe that, if I can't believe that the Virgin Mary bore a son, they called his name, his, his, his name Jesus, which means the Lord saves. And again, I'm not going to go into the, the name thing. Emmanuel, God with us, was something he would be called. It was a title. It was a characteristic. It was an understanding of who he was. But the skeptic says, Isaiah is talking about a young girl. It has nothing to do with a virgin. And so if we don't know why we believe what we believe, then we were like, Whoa, well, maybe. I, you know, I don't know how to defend that. Apologetics is the study, so I'll know how to defend it. Verse 14 is one of the most famous prophecies regarding the birth of Jesus, the Messiah in the Bible. It also illustrates that principle of prophecy, that prophecy may both have a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. The far fulfillment to Ahaz would be that Mary is going to have a, have a son. It's Jesus. He's going to be born to the virgin. We know when we get to Matthew that it's talking about a virgin because that's what Matthew tells us. Matthew is being led by the Holy Spirit. The, the word in the Greek is parthenos, and it means virgin. It does not mean young girl. It means virgin, never having had sexual encounter with a man. It means virgin. Those who deny the virgin birth, like I said, of Jesus, like to point out that here in, in, uh, in Isaiah, uh, that the Hebrew word translated virgin is alma, A-L-M-A-H, that can also be translated as young woman. And it can be. It may be translated right here in Isaiah for the, for the present fulfillment of prophecy, for the near fulfillment of prophecy, it may be talking about a young woman. And they say that the idea that, that Isaiah was simply uh, talking about a young woman would give birth, not a virgin. Well, in the near fulfillment of that prophecy, that's probably right. While the near fulfillment may have reference to a young woman giving birth, the far or ultimate fulfillment clearly points to a virgin miraculously conceiving and giving birth. We have to be able to understand and, and that and, and know how to explain it. Many commentators think that this was immediately fulfilled, this, this, uh, this uh, near uh, fulfillment, was immediately fulfilled when a young woman in the royal household shortly married, conceived a son, and unknowingly named him Emmanuel. This would have been a near fulfillment of this prophecy. And before this boy uh, came to eat solid food, Israel and Syria would be defeated. That's what God was saying through, through uh, Isaiah to Ahaz. And it's possible that God is just referring uh, in a figurative way to a year or two period of time. It's very possible. But we know when we get to Matthew that Matthew, led by the Holy Spirit to write these words, is quoting what the prophet Isaiah said back some 750 years before that this virgin would bear, conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Jesus. And you shall call him, but you shall call him, his name's going to be Jesus. Isaiah said, you shall call him his name Emmanuel, God with us. We do know that this passage speaks of Jesus because the Holy Spirit says it through Matthew. We just read it. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. We know this passage speaks of Jesus because the prophecy is addressed not only to Ahaz, but also to David's entire house. In verse 13, Isaiah says, O house of David, listen. Okay? We need to know these things. Somebody says, well, it's talking about a young girl. Maybe the near fulfillment of this prophecy is talking about a young girl. But elsewhere throughout the whole entire Old Testament, when this word Alma or Alma is used, it's talking about a virgin. It's talking about someone who has never had sexual uh, contact with a, with, with a man. So why wouldn't I believe that's what it's saying here, especially leading up into Matthew's gospel? The rest of chapter 7 describes what will take place. Judah will not only be attacked by the Assyrians, they would also be invaded by the Egyptians. Now remember, Ahaz was counting on the Assyrians to help him instead of counting on 
God. And so this group of people that he's going to trust to help him actually turns against him uh, and, and also the, the Egyptians. God would pinch Judah between these mighty nations to the north and south. You see, Ahaz would have done well to listen to maybe even some of the writings of his great, 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 great grandfather, Solomon. Now, we know that Solomon didn't write Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, but we know Solomon wrote a lot of the Proverbs, and Ahaz should have gone to the Proverbs, and he should have known them. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, a very familiar passage that we need to not just read. And many times we just read over it and over it and over it, and it doesn't really mean anything to us. That's why, to me, when I find a nugget, it just stands out, and it excites me. But God's Word is full of nuggets. 3, 5, and 6 of Proverbs says this, Trust in the Lord with what? With all your heart. All your heart. Trust in Him. Even when life's falling apart around you, trust in Him. Don't lean on your own understanding. Your ingenuity, your knowledge, your worldly wisdom is not enough. Don't lean on that. But in all your ways, acknowledge Him. Trust Him. Ahaz would have done well to trust in God. God said, ask for a sign and I'll give it to you. No, I'm not going to ask for a sign. Do what God says. As we read through Scripture, He tells us how to have a good marriage. Do what it says, you'll have a good marriage. It tells us how to be good parents. Do what it says and you'll be a good parent. It tells us how to be children who can be blessed of the Lord and, and have long lives. Do what it says, you'll be blessed of the Lord and have long lives. That's why it's so important that we get our children into the Word of God. God's Word is full of truth. It's what it is. It's full of nuggets. It's full of signs to us. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, God, and He will make, your stra make straight your paths. Who or what are you trusting? I believe in the virgin birth because Matthew tells me that Jesus was born of a virgin. I don't care what the skeptic says. I believe God's Word. It stood the test of time. It's changed lives. It's changed my life. I can trust it. I need to believe it. But I also need to be, know how to defend it. I need to be able to go back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and says, yes, that may very well be talking about a young girl in the near present prof prophetic part of it. But we know that down the road, some 700 plus years later, this virgin named Mary is going to have a son because the prophet Isaiah is looking down the road as well. The Holy Spirit says, it's going to be, Jesus is going to be born of a virgin, so I can trust it. I don't care what the skeptics say. Parents, help your children to know this and to understand this. Well, to bring it all to a close, almost 2,000 years have passed since the New Testament uh, canon was completed. And though the Word is full of grace and truth, and though the birth, life, and death of Jesus fulfilled a staggering array of Old Testament prophecies, the Jews as a people, have yet to open their eyes and ears. Isn't it sad? But we're told that's going to happen. Remember Romans chapter 11. The good news is that God, in His mercy, has promised a reuniting of the northern and the southern kingdoms. And you can read about that in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. God has promised that there's going to be a reuniting. And here's when it's going to happen. And we've spent a long time recently studying this. When the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, reigns in His millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign, all hostility, jealousy, and conflict among the tribes will be put to rest, and a remnant will both see and hear. There's coming a time when the northern tribes and the southern tribes are going to come back together. We just studied that. What I need to do, what you need to do, is we need to trust God. We need to trust His Word. We need to learn it for ourselves. We need to learn how to defend it. And we're going to have, I'm going to have a push for this come, upcoming new year. And I, we did it last year and nothing happened. Blame it on me. I'm the leader. We've done it two or three years in the past. We've said it. Nothing has happened with it. Blame it on the leader. I'll take full credit. This year, I want us to see how we can take the Word of God and we can disciple 
followers of Jesus Christ and teach them how to learn it, how to apply it, and how to live it. The Word of God. We need to learn it, we need to love it, and we need to live it. And that's what I want to see for 2021. Wow. And I want you to be saying, God, give me a desire, give me a thirst, give me a hunger for your word. Help me to know how to defend your word to non-believers and to skeptics and the naysayers. Help me. And he will. As always, my question to you is, do you know Jesus? Have you trusted him as your Lord and Savior? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you done that? If not, this very moment, you can place your faith and your trust in Jesus as Lord. Jesus, the one who saves. Emmanuel, God with us. I want to encourage you to do that. And believers, those of you who have placed your faith and trust in him, let's start living it. Let's start living what we say we believe. Let's learn how to defend what we say we believe. Time is short. I believe Jesus is just right around the corner. Are you prepared to meet him? Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We are blessed. We praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to encourage you uh, here just before we shut down. It's the end of the year. I want to encourage you with your year-end giving. You know, our church, even through all this mess, our church has given, and you guys have been wonderful. But if you've got some year-end giving that you want to do, uh, you need to have it in by December 31st. It needs to be postmarked if you mail it. Uh, it needs to be in uh, through the website if you go that direction, however you do it. Uh, and God bless you, okay? I love you. If you need something, give me a yell. If you're able, put aside the fear and come and join us next Sunday live, okay? Love you. Talk to you later. Have a blessed week.